Welcome to Reread. We are on book two of the Jedi Academy trilogy. Oh, just gets even better. Dark Apprentice is what it is. Um, boy, Kevin Janerson knows how to open up a story. It starts off, and I remember this clearly. Uh, the, their, the planet Vores, they've invited the New Republic to come to their glass cathedral where they sing and do music and crow and chirp or whatever. And Akbar and Akbar insists on flying uh, Princess Leia himself just to make sure that she's taken care of. Well, when their B-wing hits in the atmosphere, suddenly everything's going haywire. Akbar can't, you know, right the ship. He lets Leia eject, and he crashes into the cathedral and sends the whole thing crashing down on top of him. Now, you're supposed to think he's dead. Like, I thought he was dead when I first read this. But he does survive. But the thing is, though, that's how you open up a book. You kill Akbar. And, or you make people think you killed Akbar. And there's a great... And I remember this scene immediately, because right before he ejected uh, Leia... He turned to her, kind of sadly, and went, "Tell the Vors, I'm sorry." Like you know, he couldn't he couldn't control the B wing, so he's so sorry. Great scene. Uh, anyway, this is another great book where Han and Lando play Sabacc over the Falcon. I think about three times, and it's great. Each one keeps losing. Like Lando has been taking care of the Falcon ever since he he got it back from Kessel. Han didn't have it, and Lando did. And Han's been kind of distracted. Well, he's been with his kids and whatnot. Lando's just kind of kept, kept the Falcon since then. And he's been cleaning it up and reworking it. And it was so funny. And Han's like, what are you doing with my ship? He went, Han, it's a junk keep. I'm fixing it for you. It's even better than it was before. It was my ship before yours. He went, it's so nasty in here. I've, I had to clean it out. He went, and it smelled too. And Han's like, that was my smell. I like that smell. I like that dirt. That's my dirt. And it feels like Harrison Ford, like Han Solo would say that. I think he writes these characters awesome. And Lando talks about, well, uh, Lando talk, uh, Han and Lando get in an argument. So they say, okay, you want to bet, you want to you go to Sabacc and bet the Falcon again? He's like, sure, buddy, let's do it. You know, against your million diamonds that he got from, you know, turning that reward from the Duchess or whatnot in the previous book. So they decide to go for it. And, oh man, again, another hilarious scene with 3PO. It's, it's random Sabacc, where the rules always change every few minutes. So 3PO reads up on the rules, and he's the kind of referee as they keep playing. He keeps changing the rules every so often. And it's so hilarious, because the whole time 3PO is trying to whine and complain and get out of it. And, they're t you know, Lando's telling him to shut up. Han's telling him to shut up. And at the very end, 3PO goes, oh my, word, oh my lord, I don't know if I can do this. And both of them turn to 3PO and go, shut up. <laughs> It's just so good. It's so funny. And Han is about to win the whole game until at the last minute, 3PO, to, 3PO says the rules have changed, which gives Lando the lead, Lando the win. He owns the Falcon. Han is really upset. Uh, Leia has been you know, hurt or captured or injured at this point. He doesn't know what's going on with Leia, so he's been distracted. Lando says, look, buddy, you just got all heated up in the moment because you're worried about your wife. I'll give you the Falcon back. I don't really want it. You can have it. Because he knows Han is like stunned that he just lost the Falcon. He's like, no, no, a deal's a deal. I'm not welching on a deal. Which is exactly what Han Solo would do. You know, he loves the Falcon, but a deal's a deal. And so he kind of marched away. And Lando feels kind of bad now. But Lando's going to let him, well, I said let him win. Lando's going to lose the Falcon again uh, next time to Han. It's just, oh man, it's so good. It was, um... Oh gosh, there's so many good things in this one, but that that little uh, how how they bicker and how they're still friends. You you still get their friends even though they're bickering with one another the whole time. Perfect. Only Kevin J. Anderson can write like that. Now a few things I want to talk about here. Uh, the one of the reasons I really love Dala is they they they're giving as Dala and her ships that they come out of the mall. You know, of course they're one star destroyer short now, but. She just wants to cause havoc. And they're saying, hey, look, you are the last living admiral, we think. So you could actually run the Empire if you wanted to. We've heard rumors that, you know, Warlord Zins is gone, Thrawn is gone. You really are next in command. She goes, I don't want that. She doesn't want to lead. She just wants to cause havoc. She's pissed. She wants to just blow them away, you know, with all the firepower she's got, and then just go home. She's just looking at causing chaos. She said, I'll let the other fools fight over the throne. And that, again, I just love how Dahl is written. Meanwhile, as Luke is teaching his students, Gantoris is 
talking to someone in the shadows. He's somehow, and I, I think a few, oh, I know about six months have passed by this because I think they mentioned the kids being two and a half, uh, maybe even older now, maybe close to three now. So some time has passed in between here, but Gantoris is building his own lightsaber and a very complicated lightsaber with three crystals in it that shines three different colors that can extend, you know, into a spear. Uh, and so he's learning this, and we, he's talking to a shadow in the corner. that there, There's no one there. But you're thinking, something's off here. And of course, as he and Luke fight, and he's getting angrier and angrier, Gantoris is, Luke realizes something's not right. Who is telling, how did he learn how to build a lightsaber this early? And then later on, by the way, I should mention, there's a great scene where uh, Dala has attacked Dantooine. She, take, she stops a ship, a merchant, a rebel ship, going to give him supplies, blows up that ship, and then goes to Dantooine and kills Gantoris' entire uh, village people there. It, and it's a really good scene. Adats and two-legged walkers and stuff that just just going at ATSTs. They're all going at them. And they're like the the village people are like, they hear something, they hear thunder. It's actually them, the, the machines walking. And then lasers, rain, you know, green bur acid burns rain you know, raining from the green rain or whatever. It's the it's the laser blast. They don't they can't put the two together because they're kind of primitive. But then they see where it's coming from, these giant machines, and they're running in terror. But I mean, Dala slaughters them all. Just when you thought, yeah, now I'm used to Dala being the good, kind kind of good guy now. But back then, yeah, she was evil. She just wanted revenge. She was mad. And she's seeing Tarkin in her head like he would slap her for what, and, and Kevin Janderson always says this, though that is kind of a, it's something that he puts in back-to-back uh, -back books, I think, that, oh, if Tarkin could see that she lost another Star Destroyer, he'd slap her on the face for that. Okay, so he pops women. There you go. Tarkin's even super bad there. But at the same time, she wants to make him proud, and that's the whole purpose of what, her campaign here, which, again, I really like. Now, of course, Exar Kun is going to show or tell uh, Gantors about his uh, d his his people on Dantooine. They got slaughtered. Gan he shows Gantors the vision. Gantors sees it, gets mad, goes after Exar Kun. This is where he kind of burns alive from the inside. Great scene. The chapter, in you know, everyone kind of wakes up in the night, hears a scream. They get Luke. Luke goes to Gantors' room. He is a charred remains. Looks like he's been screaming and he's on the floor, you know, just kind of burned through. And Luke feels sick to his stomach, you know, because he's never seen this before. He knows the dark, it's reeking of the dark side in there. And he kind of leans on the doorway and turns to his student, students and croaks, Beware the dark side. Oh, it's a go. Oh, give me, I, got, I, got, I got goosebumps just now. Let's transition to a funny scene with 3PO, one that I'd totally forgotten about. Chewbacca is trying to tell the New Republic that he wants them to send a mission back into the mall, not just to destroy the Death Star prototype, but to free all the Wookiee slaves, because Wookiee slaves are still there, and he wants them to free the slaves. Well, 3PO is interpreting for him, and uh, there's a top moment where Chewbacca slaps him upside the head and went, I know that's not what you said, you giant furball. I'm saying it better. <laughs> I think Chewbacca's cussing in this. He goes, and he would really like the Chewbacca, blah, blah, blah. and he's like, and then Chewbacca brrr, yells at him, he's like, Oh, it's literally the same thing you said, but with much more etiquette, you know. And I, I again, 3PO is hilarious. This is the funniest I've ever seen him in this trilogy. So good. All right, so who is the spy for the Rebellion? His name is Tefron. He was brainwashed by uh, Fergan, the ambassador for Corita. He's the one that, uh, you know, uh, Akbar trusts him. He checked his B-Wing personally and told Akbar later on that there was nothing wrong with the B-Wing. It must have been Akbar. And the whole time we're thinking he's a good guy. No, he's been brainwashed to do whatever this guy says. And I can't remember if they give him... Yeah, I, he he will eventually, when Cardia is destroyed, he, he feels that the pressure on his brain is gone. He doesn't have to do their will anymore. And so he chases off to... Because he knows he's betrayed the secret location. He found the secret location, I think, of An where Anakin's being held. And he wants to stop that uh, f uh, that uh, team, Imperial team, that's going out to Anoth to try to capture Anakin. Because the whole purpose of uh, uh, Fergan was to capture Anakin Solo. and you know, Because he knows, he knows he's the gr uh, grandson of Darth Vader and kind of raise him up to kind of be the next rightful ruler of the Empire. I really like that. I'd totally forgotten about that. But that's actually a pretty good storyline there. Uh, and this one, 
Oh man, there's so much going on here. All right, so let's talk about Winter Akbar, right? Yeah, it is kind of weird because when Akbar has officially retired, he goes to see Winter at Anath. Why? I don't know, but they're friends, I guess. And Winter asks him to stay. He kind of looks at her lovingly and she goes, because it's lonely. Anakin's lonely. I'm lonely. You're like, what is going on here? Because <laughs> especially, and I'll be honest, this came out before the X-Wing books. So Stackpole did not want this happening. And so he created Tycho uh, to be with Winter. So how can we put this in perspective? Well, Winter is just a caring soul. And maybe she sees Akbar as a loving father. You know, not that loving. But you know, the, the, the pat on the head, good job, daughter kind of father. Is that creepy? Meanwhile, Lando is giving it his all on Mara Jade, and I love it. He's, he's all dressed up, he's all flashy, he's always trying to impress her, trying to get good stuff for her, and the interaction, Mara's just like so sarcastic with him the whole time, like she needs a ride, because Kip had, uh, later on, Kip's gonna be tempted by Gantorus, and he's gonna leave with Mara's ship, and Mara's gonna be stranded. Lando's the one that's gonna try to pick her up, and he's also trying to pick her up. <laughs> uh, but she's like, here, let me get your bag. She went, oh, good. You finally found a purpose in life, a baggage boy. And he's like, <laughs> you know, and then one time she walks away and he blows her a kiss. And it says that, you know, it's, it, you know, but Mara wasn't watching. And that's probably a good thing. <laughs> I love it. I, I am a fan of Lando Mara, which I don't know if anyone is but me, but I'm a big fan. Uh, this is where we hear the story of the Little Lost Bantha Cub. I forgot that Kevin Jansen basically verbatim reads the book. I mean, has Han Solo read the book to the kids. So you basically know what's all going on. And that's because there is a scene. Uh, people think this stupid. I, I don't think it's stupid. But Jason and Jaina, they're two and a half or close to three years old at this point, And they get lost as they're going on a museum tour with 3PO and Chewbacca. They, they lose them on purpose. And they get lost in the undercity of Coruscant. It kind of ends suddenly where they meet this guy who calls himself the king. And, you know, they think, oh, man, this guy's crazy. He's going to kill him. You know, he's part of a cult. And he feeds them and then brings them up to the surface. And the very next uh, page, you know, he's like, here you go. And Han's like, you know, the emperor's dead now. You don't have to live down there. He went, yeah. He said, I'm going to be honest with you. Up here, I was a janitor. But down there, I'm king. And he walk, goes away and Han's like, that's not a bad deal. <laughs> I really love that. I know people are like, oh, little kids wouldn't get lost like that. They wouldn't act like that. Remember, they have the force. So they're a little bit smarter than your average three-year-old or close to three-year-old. And I know my little girls would definitely run away if me and my wife weren't paying attention at that, at that, uh, at that age either. So if they had the force, oh boy. I remember there's one where Luke is kind of levitating them through the force. He goes, ah, the force is powerful. I sense the force is powerful in this one. Oh, wait. That's something else. Leia, she went, oh, I'm used to it. Give me him. <laughs> Had to change a diaper. It's so good. Uh, of course, uh, Exar Kun, we find out, is the spirit because he appears before Kip. Kip's kind of discouraged because he's trying to learn as much as he can, but Luke's like, hey, you got to learn patience too. You'll get to everything. Well, Exar Kun takes advantage of that and... I don't know if anyone has a problem with this, but Kip immediately embraces Exar Kun's teaching and the dark side and everything and, and gets to be dark and angry and upset. And that's where he leaves and steals the sun crusher and, you know, kills tons of people. And you're thinking, wait, so Kip just joined the dark side? Well, yeah, because before that, not many people know about the Force. Still, Luke just started his academy. He just found out he had the Force. He doesn't really know that the dark side is all that bad. It hasn't been justified. There haven't been Jedi in decades. In de since the Clone Wars, they haven't seen this many Je Jedi, so they don't know. And in Kip's lifetime, he's never seen a Jedi. He didn't even know what they were. Okay? So how is he supposed to know? So yeah, he's easily tempted. If Exar Kun's showing him stuff that Luke can't, and he's getting more powerful, he doesn't realize the dark side is threatening his, you know, whole, you know, destiny, even though Luke tells him that. Uh, there's another one where Luke is not going to let Kip, Kip leave because Kip's getting the Sun Crusher. Luke doesn't want him to leave, ignites his lightsaber, but with the help of Exar Kun, Kip freezes his hands or kind of puts ice over his hands and extinguishes the lightsaber real quick. And then the spirit of Exar Kun attacks Luke. This is where people get, you know, all, all pissy, I guess, about it. They, they don't like this. But then that makes Luke unconscious and he's not in his body, which is going to be explored more in the third book. But a lot of people didn't like that either. But guess what? That kind of out-of-body experience happens all the time, right? 
essence transfer. We've already talked about this. So your essence can leave the body. So it's already been established on this. This is actually a cool way because a, a Sith, he's never been attacked by a Sith spirit before. And we've seen, if you look at, you know, Tales of the Jedi and stuff, Sith spirits can do some awful stuff, man. So I, I, I don't know why all the hate is on this. I, I really thought this was really good. One thing I found weird that Bors Fila is missing from this trilogy. I guess Kevin Jansen didn't want to ride him. Or you could say, since his embarrassment from Last Command, you know, he kind of, has some egg on his face, he's been quiet ever since, that he just has kind of been laying low for the next couple of years, or next year or two years, however long it's been in between uh, M Dark Empire and that. So I, I guess, but I, I at least would have loved to have Bors Fila mention that he's still around. He is not even mentioned, I don't think, in any of these books. I haven't read the third one yet, but I don't think he's mentioned yet in any of them, which I thought was kind of weird. Uh, Akbar, as he's retired, goes back to Mon Calamari. Leia goes and search for him. That's where she meets Ambassador Silgal, who is going to be another one of Je uh, Luke's eventual uh, Jedi acolytes, and she's going to be good at healing, even though that's going to be explored in the third book. But And I already know it. And I was I wondering when that heater was going to start back again. Okay, so we're back out here now. Uh, Mama Nadon is in it. Uh, when uh, uh, Wes takes Cusux, and this is where they're kind of falling in love, and I love these two together. I love a fighter pilot and someone who's a scientist, who's an egghead, opposite to Tract. You know, Wedge is kind of taken in by her exotic looks. And yeah, I be and she loves Wedge because Wedge is a protector and all around nice guy. And she hasn't met anyone like him before. I get it. I hate that they tore that uh, relationship up later on, but I'll talk about that when we get to the book. Uh, Kip in this book, Exar Kun makes him see Luke as, and it says here, weak and indecisive. And you think about it, Luke is very indecisive in New Jedi Order. Kip's opinion of Luke, even though he has way more respect for him now, at the very base of it, he's still, in the back of his mind, maybe because of the influence of Exar Kun, will always see Luke as not perfect. Like, great, great guy, great Jedi Master, he'll follow him, but he's not perfect because he's very indecisive, hesitant to make the real decisions. And Kip, again, I can see myself as Kip Durin, he just wants to take it to the Empire. He just wants to kill them all. What's bad with that? Now, I know that's good. I know later on, I think my Mothman and all them talk about, because people want to hail him as a hero for what he does in book three, and, and my moth is like, no, he's a butcher or whatever. I haven't, I ha like, again, I haven't read it, but I remember there was a discussion like that going on because he's killing the bad guys. He's not killing the New Republic. He's killing the Empire, and that's a good thing, right? But he's causing mass destruction, and that's what Luke and everyone else is against. Uh, and by the way, Jason and Jane, I, I mentioned them already getting lost, but that mimics Little Lost Bantha Cub. I don't know if anyone knew that, but they're kind of having the same story in their own way, their own telling of what happened through the Little Lost Bantha Cub. So as Han was reading the story, it was just foreshadowing what was going to eventually happen with Jaina and Jason. And again, I really liked it. Uh, Kip flying over. One of the things I also like about Kip, he flew to Endor to kind of search through Darth Vader's ashes to see if there's anything he could find. You know, Sith, right? He's become a fan of the Sith now. And as he passes over the village, he also sees a Gorax slamming through the uh, Endor forest looking for Ewoks. And I thought that was just such a cool reference because not many references to those Ewoks movies. And Gorax has, of course, played a big role there. Uh, Han and Lando place the Bach again for the Falcon, this time for the third and final time. It's in front of Mara. They said, Mara, will you be the judge? She went, I don't care. Mara doesn't even want to be there. But Lando's trying to impress her. Well, when he wins, of course, Han's you know heart is in his stomach now. He's so upset. How could he be so stupid to bet the Falcon away? But Lando, to impress Mara Jade, graciously gives it to Han in exchange for messing with the food uh, food, uh, food dispensers, instead of having sloppy, greasy Karelian food, having something eloquent to, to provide more jade. You know, some uh, upper crust. Uh, and that it's, it's a really good, again, more comedy, great scene, more jade, not interested, and Lando is just going, you know, full court press on her. I absolutely love it. Uh, toward the end of this, Kip is getting kind of, you know, evil now. He's gone to Q-Zux. He thinks she's very dangerous, and in a way he's right, because she has all this knowledge of all these super death, death weapons in her brain, so he just takes the force and rakes through her brain, like, and she, she describes it as razors, just uh, you know, slicing through her brain, ripping out memories. And he was a little too rough with it, too. But in Kip's mind, she you know, 
knowingly created these weapons of mass destruction and she didn't care, that's irresponsible. She deserves to be tortured. Not killed, but tortured. So again, I can, ah, you kind of see where Kip's going, coming from here. But uh, when, and they, Wedge and Q had just kissed the night before, so Wedge is all dappered up. I think he has flowers. He goes to meet Q-Zucks, sees her door open, runs in, the lights are off, and she's there kind of crying. She's trying to remember his name, but right now she doesn't know what happened, but someone has ripped through her memories and she can't remember anything, which is kind of horrific, but at the same time, wow, really good. Now, uh, Kip destroys another one of Dollar Star, uh, Star Destroyers, uh, and uh, so she's down to, well, she's down to one now, I should say, because I forgot, in the Battle of Mon Calamari, because Dalla shows up there, Admiral, Ar Admiral Atbar takes command, you know, even though he doesn't want to be an admiral, he's not an admiral anymore, he takes command of his home planet, and as they're fighting, he goes, wait a minute. He said, I know this strategy. Because remember, he was, a, he was a slave for Tarkin. And since Dalla is a disciple of Tarkin, she's using Tarkin's moves. And Atbar goes, I know this. I know there's a star destroyer behind that moon, and 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 so Akbar successfully destroys the star destroyer that's hiding in the back for some kind of counterattack or whatever, some kind of flank, and he recognizes one of Tarkin's old, it's now old, uh, strategies that Dala is still using. Really brilliant stuff. Overall, Dark Apprentice, excellent. Again, read this book in one day. One day. I didn't even have to. No one forced a gun to my head. I enjoyed every minute of it. I am really liking the Jedi Academy trilogy. I am really loving it. I think it's excellent. It's an excellent series. So, how is Champions of the Force? Find out next time.